everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Nonprofit Show. Okay, I'm a little nervous today because of our guest, Vanessa Ruiz. If you are from the Western United States, you will recognize Vanessa as an Emmy award-winning broadcaster. She's done some amazing things throughout our Southwestern communities in the Western United States. And wow, you know, Vanessa, I always tease my mother, why didn't you make me become at least a weather girl so I could have learned this process <laughs> because I'm not an on-air talent. And so having you on, whew, that's important. <laughs> Wendy's like, yeah, me too. So welcome, Vanessa. Thank you, Julia. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. And I don't know what you're talking about. You're a pro. So <laughs> thank you for having me. And also hi to you, Wendy, as well. <laughs> Great well, to see you, me. Vanessa. <laughs> well, we're really excited to have this conversation with you today because two of the best words in the English language, risk and impact. And you're going to be talking to us about how you started off in one career and you've moved through to another. I think they're very similar careers, so we'll get into that. But um, we're going to be talking about the journey of a leader and, and what it means and what it looks like and what it can mean. And so I can't wait to have this conversation with you. You know, another conversation that we have daily is with our presenting sponsors, and they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Fundraisers Friday, and Your Part-Time Controller. These are the folks that join us day in and day out, and they really make a difference in so many lives across our sector. We also have amazing co-hosts. Again, I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. Been joined by the intrepid Wendy F. Adams, CFRE herself, uh, Cultivate for Good. So Wendy, my friend, welcome, and I'm delighted you're with us today. Fantastic. I'm excited for the fun. Yeah, it's going to be great. Okay, Vanessa Ruiz, um, I've known you and followed your career um, as a fangirl. Um, your husband and I have known each other for many, many years. Um, and I first met him as a young man in the marketing sector that collided with my publishing business. Um, over the years, I've seen him navigate towards um, the nonprofit sector in terms of marketing and communications, and he's brilliant. And then the two of you joined forces and created even more brilliance. Talk to us about Bear Fruit. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thanks again, Julia. Bear Fruit is really our baby. It's our way of giving back to the community and saying we want to work with nonprofit organizations and other entities to help these organizations raise more money so they can do greater impact on the communities they serve, period. And how do we do that? We do that with fundraising strategy development. We also do that with grant research, writing and reporting, donor development, um, whether it's also corporate or philanthropic partnerships, as you and your audience know, it really runs the gamut in terms of <laughs> And so, again, we work with the, these organizations, their leadership to expand again and make sure that that impact continues to grow so that they can serve their clients and also be able to focus on their mission. Interesting. You know, that's a heavy lift. Mm -hmm. uh, Wendy, as a, a CFRE, a certified uh, fundraising executive, I'm sure you're just like, wow, this is what we need, right? Absolutely. I mean, pen ready. Come on, Vanessa, let's do it. <laughs> this is exactly what we need. I mean, yeah. Yeah. It's well, really good. And, and to that point, I will say it is a very much needed uh, service. You know that. Um, I, I, My previous role at Arizona State University, a small part of it involved grants and applying for grants. Mm -hmm. And I know the process, how long, how detailed. A lot of our, the organizations in the nonprofit world either don't have the bandwidth, don't have the staff, or if they do, they still choose to outsource and work with consulting firms like Bear Fruit because they know that at the end of the day, that is a service they're willing to pay for so that they can focus 
on all the other long list of priorities that nonprofits have to do. So again, we think of it, frankly, as a privilege. We think mm -hmm. um, it's a privilege to be able to work with these organizations. And as I said earlier, be able to help them achieve greater success and impact mm -hmm. through their fundraising efforts. Yeah. yeah. It's really important. I, I want to kind of go back a little bit. As I mm -hmm. mentioned when we first introduced you, um, I know you as your award-winning work as a broadcaster, as a journalist, as a community leader. Talk to us about how you took those skills, which I would say are pretty specific, and then you've mm -hmm. transitioned them into the great nonprofit sector. I know your husband, Sam Albert, has worked in the nonprofit sector, and I'm sure there's a lot he could communicate and share. But at the end of the day, you've had to dig deep within your own skill set from these other sectors. What does that look like? I think, Julia, my various professional experiences have contributed to me developing these various skills over time. So, for example, the uh, capacity for writing and research, the attention mm. to detail, the ability to exceed intense daily deadlines, all of those things trace back to my journalism days where you have to deliver a product of high quality every single day, come rain or shine. You have to figure it out. So that teaches you to be nimble, to act quickly, to know a little bit about a lot of things. Now, moving forward to the seven years I spent at ASU, there I was able to develop as a leader, as an individual, helping to oversee various teams to invest in people, to make sure that they are growing. Um, again, all of these skills put together is what now I'm bringing to bear fruit. I often get asked by people, how do, how do you go from the world of broadcast journalism, then into higher education, and now to helping nonprofits? And my answer is very simple. To me, there's a clear connecting thread throughout that journey. And it's all about access. For mm -hmm. Vanessa Louise, my passion in life has been able to provide access for others. What do I mean by that? When I was a journalist, it was so that people could access information that could make their lives better, that they could make informed decisions for themselves, for their families, for their communities, to give voice to those who perhaps maybe didn't have a voice. When I transitioned into higher education, very similarly, I wanted to make sure that those students, those the faculty and the staff who perhaps didn't have access, who didn't have um, a road to those opportunities, that I could help pave that way for them. And now again, in this current role, it's about access. It's about accessing additional funds, additional resources, so that we can do better we could do more good in the world. So again, there's that connecting thread of access and also, frankly, um, justice, fairness, opportunity. I think that's a thread that's um, clearly defined in the various roles that I've had throughout my career. It's such wow. an interesting thing to hear you say that because I would imagine as a, as a journalist and a broadcaster, you kind of, while you were an independent worker uh, and thinker, you had to kind of toe the, the line <laughs> um, according to deadlines, uh, content direction, what the producers are telling you, um, how the story flows into the, the whole of your, uh, your broadcast and your episode. And so it's really interesting to think about taking all of your energy and your knowledge and cramming it into 90 to 120 seconds, if you will, of broadcasting, right? I mean, because you don't have the luxury of like, we have a 30 minute show where we can talk and we can ask questions. You got to slam this in. It's a um, sound bite. <laughs> yeah, it's very interesting, right? I mean, you got to, it seems to me like you've learned to filter a lot of things mm. in, a, in a quick period of time so that you could um, communicate. I mean, I don't know if that's fair or not, but it's a, that's just more of an observation. A hundred percent. It teaches you to be concise, to get to the point, to be clear, 
right? Um, it, and for me, at least also, it has required that I be a quick study, that oh. you learn quickly, that you're able to grasp topics, ideas, notions of things mm -hmm. far and wide um, in a clear way. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, when you're in the world of journalism, you develop such a valuable skill set. And when, and I talk to people all the time, when they're in that industry, it's hard to see yourself doing something, anything other than journalism, mm -hmm. right? And I tell people all the time, those, th those skills that you have that mm -hmm. you developed are so valuable in other fields. Don't undersell yourself. Do not underestimate yourself. I am living proof of that. What we learn, again, as journalists, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, meet and exceed deadlines to deliver. Also, to not take no for an answer. You know, when you get doors slammed in your face <laughs> day in and day out, when you're trying to interview someone or you need you need to speak with someone and you've never met them, right? You learn how to cold call. You learn mm -hmm. how to cold no, you get through those fears relatively quickly because otherwise you are not going to get the story. And again, mm -hmm. those are all things that tenaciousness yes. that serve you well in any other industry after you leave the world of journalism. I, <coughs> you choked me up here. I love that. Um, Wendy. Yes. I'm fascinated by this because you are the fundraising guru. Well, <laughs> let's talk about that circle. How do you navigate in through fundraising? Well, and one of the things that Vanessa, you mentioned, or you spoke through was the connectivity of people in all of those aspects, right? It was access for, but people in each of those spaces, which ties back into the why of what you're doing in each of those different places that you were in. And that's what it all comes down to in fundraising, right? Um, those that we are serving, those that we are partnering with, the communities that we're serving. And so I love how you are bringing that out is this is just who you've been and who you are in each aspect of these different journeys and chapters in your space. Thanks, Wendy. I appreciate that. And it's true. Again, people sometimes will still ask me, you left a very lucrative career in the world of broadcast journalism. You had a great role here, at least in Phoenix. When I arrived, I was the NBC News anchor in the evenings. Why mm -hmm. would you do all of that? And I have to say, I had a fantastic 17 year career, 17 years in the, in the journalism business. I still do a bit of that with PBS News Hour, but full time 17 years. And to your point earlier, it's about the people. It's about connection. It's about, for me, information and knowledge has always been power. And yeah. so if we can equip individuals, again, um, support them to make better mm -hmm. decisions, to go towards a more positive pathway, why we, wouldn't we want to do that? You know, again, for me, my life experiences have led me towards this road. I, I am the very proud daughter of an immigrant single mother who was only able to finish high school herself. And yet was very, very clear always, education is a priority. Education was a pathway for me to have a fantastic career, to be able to now um, generationally, right? Be able to provide a better life for my own family. So I think, I think and I feel, I have a very deep responsibility to make sure that those of us who have had these opportunities open those doors of opportunity for others who may not otherwise have that. And again, I think that to me, to your question earlier, that's the why. That's a lot of what we do in the nonprofit world, mm -hmm. right? It's that sense of uplifting and helping. Yes. Um, and again, it's a privilege. Yeah. You know, it's so interesting to me that um, we talk about in fundraising, Vanessa, the correlation between relationships and how we can steward um, stronger um, connections to our nonprofits through these, these relationships. I'm wondering, as you come to the table, if there are people that feel like they know you because they've seen you mm -hmm. on TV, they've seen you as a broadcaster, as a journalist, and then they're like, oh yeah, I mean, your, your credibility skyrockets. You, you have this sense that I, she's been in my home. She's been in my living room, you know, <laughs> all of that. And I'm wondering if you see that. I want to make sure I understand your question, Julia. Are you talking about 
when I meet and connect with folks? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. yeah. I mean, because you you bring almost this background of a perceived connection mm -hmm. um, or relationship that is not necessarily like where everybody else, Wendy or I show up, we've got to start from ground yes. zero. Yeah. But then there's this sense that, oh yeah, I know her. I trust her. I value her. Do you know what I'm saying? It's really an interesting sure. um, dynamic, if you will. Sure. It's pretty yeah. unique. I think it all comes down to integrity. Mm. I think mm. if you move and act with integrity in what you do, people see that, people perceive that. And also, frankly, how many times have you met someone that perhaps you admired or you looked up to and they ended up being a disappointment? <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> honest. I know I've had mm -hmm. those moments. They didn't end up being the person that I hoped they would be. Yeah. And it, <laughs> that stays with you. Yeah. That stays with you and it changes your perception of that person. And gosh, that stings. I will mm -hmm. say some of the biggest lessons in my career happened very early on when I was mm -hmm. very young and very green. And I had, and I say this now, the fortune of encountering colleagues in my profession that were just not good people or didn't mm -hmm. act with integrity or didn't treat others with respect and professionalism. Mm -hmm. Those were the biggest lessons for me because yeah. I always said when I saw someone behaving that way, I never want to be that. I never want to be like that person. And so I've mm -hmm. always tried in all of my roles, whether they were professional or personal, Mm -hmm. to be a humble, kind, authentic person mm -hmm. um, for good, for better, for worse. but those are values that have yeah. always been incredibly important to me mm -hmm. because I want people to say, oh, I worked with her. Oh, I met her once and it was a positive interaction. It was a positive mm -hmm. experience. That's what I want to leave people with because yes, they may think or feel as like they know you, but imagine if I ended up being someone that was a disappointment in that regard. Yeah, it's brutal. And it's, you know, Wendy, we talk about this a lot. We are building relationships that need to transcend our, our own personalities because we want to connect people to our missions. It's a it's a fascinating paradigm, right? It, it absolutely is. And, and Vanessa, you made a point. It's consistency. They met you here and they meet you here. Is it the same? Is that the same person? And so, yes, um, we know a meaningful connection is the is what's at the core of everything that we're talking about. And uh, I love how you bring that out and how you're emphasizing. They may see me on screen, but who am I? And yeah. is that the same person? And that's what's so important with what we're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, it's really, it's really, really critical. I want to yeah. go into another form of risk that we've been talking mm -hmm. about. Um, and then looking at cultivating leadership. Um, it's really an interesting thing because I think a lot of times we think, oh, what could they bring to the table? Because they've been in, you know, engineering or in your case in broadcasting, or they've been in education or or whatever. Um how do you see this? Because you've mentioned this a couple of times, and that is the issue of leadership and the ability to transfer your skills. What does that look like to you? Sure. Well, I can share with you and your audience that after 17 years, right, in the news business, I took a risk. I decided mm -hmm. that I was going to transition from that industry into higher education, an industry I had never been a part of. I didn't really know the ins and outs of it, mm -hmm. but I or at least at that time, I hoped that I could make a deeper impact in the community by working in higher ed. And I remember when I first started at ASU thinking to myself, well, I'll give this a year. I'll give this experiment a year. And if this doesn't work out, I can always go back to the world of journalism. Well, fast forward seven years at the university. I started as a professor of practice and I ended up at, right before I left as a deputy vice president of one of the largest units at the university, which happens to be the largest public university in the entire country. Mm -hmm. And, and I will be honest, I think some would say that I was on a trajectory upward 
that as a deputy VP, the next step would be vice president. And I had to take a step back and be mm. honest with myself and reassess what are the things that I want in my life, both personally and professionally. Mm. And I had to get honest. And I, and I said, I don't think this is the path that I want. And so mm. I took another risk. I left what was a secure, as secure as any job can be, right? <laughs> But a secure, well-paying um, role where I, I was doing good in the community, where I was helping students access their dream of education to jump into bare fruit mm -hmm. and say, okay, I've done that now for seven years. Let me now totally change the page again yeah. and be a part of my own business. So not only running the business, but growing the business, any entrepreneur business owner knows how difficult that is, but also now let's figure out different and new ways to continue to help the community and organizations that serve it. Again, mm -hmm. risk, risk, risk. One of the biggest risks was moving from my very, again, comfortable life in Florida 10 years ago and heading West, yeah. not knowing a single soul. However, if I hadn't taken those risks, I wouldn't be where I am today. I wouldn't have the experiences that I have today. And so my message to your audience is take the risk, mm. grow, because otherwise you will regret what you didn't do versus yeah. what you did do. And that's always been a big one for me. I want to regret perhaps the things that I tried that didn't work out versus the ones that I'm always left wondering what if change is uncomfortable, even want to change, but it's the only way we grow. So take mm -hmm. risks because at the end of the day, what's the worst that can happen, right? Mm -hmm. And this is what I tell myself and people I mentor, you will figure it out. You yeah. will not allow yourself to fail. Mm -hmm. Right. Give yourself more grace and give yourself more credit mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, you will figure it out just like you figured everything else out in your life up until mm -hmm. that point. Right. You know, I love that message because we need to hear that. Uh, mm -hmm. Wendy, in the nonprofit sector, we're oh, yeah. surprisingly so risk adverse. Right. Oh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> Who are you telling? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, you know. And it's like, it's such an interesting thing. I feel like uh, COVID is tragic mm. as, it, as it was, and it continues to be, um, that it is one of those things that pushed the nonprofit mm -hmm. sector in a really positive way. And so at so many levels, and that if we didn't have that, um, we'd still be doing the same things. We, we really would. And, and Vanessa, you pointed out, it's surrender. Your hands were always open. Okay. And, and how you can continue to connect with people, what was next, you know, what your motivation was for everything that you were doing, that mm -hmm. place of this isn't mine and it's, it's really for the betterment of the many. It, that's something that, you're right, Julia, we were pushed out of our comfort zone because of COVID and, and all that came with it and said, this isn't really ours. It's not the individual hours, it's all of ours collectively. That's what I'm hearing, man. You're continuing to educate, Vanessa. <laughs> oh, thank you, Wendy. I do want to add one additional point to that, which is when I say take a risk, make it a calculated risk. Yes. <laughs> I want to be clear on that. I don't want yes. people now just doing all kinds of things. Think through what you yes. want to do. Um, weigh the pros and the cons, right? Mm -hmm. What is the very worst that could happen if you make mm -hmm. that move? And then you know, how would you address that? Again, calculated risks. I think that's the key. Right. Don't you think, Vanessa, that um, it's also about allowing yourself to say, I'm going to make a correction. You know, mm. it, it, it's okay to be able to say, it's not going to always be, you know, rainbows and unicorns. It, there's going to be problems. But if I can make a correction, then we'll navigate forward. I mean, and we, you use the word give Wendy, you know, give ourselves grace. I think a lot of times we forget that, that we can, uh, to your point, Vanessa, make, make a resolution that's going to work, right? That we know these things. A hundred percent. First of all, we're all human. Yeah. I think it's part of the human experience to make mistakes. 
and hopefully learn and grow from those mistakes. And if you know that something's not working out, as you said, that you need to make a correction, better do it quickly, better do it in a way where you're addressing the issue head on versus letting something fester grow and get worse or not wanting to perhaps um, face a mistake that you've made. As a leader, I will say it was important to me to always raise my hand and acknowledge if I had made a mistake um, or if I had made a, a, a bad judgment call because I really value that transparency, mm -hmm. uh, especially when I see it in others, right? When I see it in, um, in other leaders, um, to me, that's a sign of a good leader uh, because we should always be growing. We should always mm -hmm. be learning. If we're at a place where we think we know it all, we've done it all, mm -hmm. we like you might as well just shut the door and go to bed because mm -hmm. Again, as long as we're breathing, in my view, we're growing and we're learning as human beings. So don't be afraid to acknowledge that you've made a mistake. In my book, that is a sign of courage. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. It's really important. I've got to ask you to get out your crystal ball and shine it up and say, given the trajectory of your illustrious career and, and you know, you've You've been so successful in, in our community um, and in the Western United States. Where do you see the next five years taking you? <laughs> That's a great question, Julia. Well, um, as I shared with you, so I just started my role at Bear Fruit. It is a company that I'm proud to say continues to grow. We continue to work with fantastic organizations and clients that inspire me and the rest of our team. So my vision, at least professionally, is to be able to continue to grow our firm in a way that allows us to be able to work with more uh, organizations to do more good in our communities. That would be one thing. So expansion of our business. But also, as you know, I'm also a wife and a mother mm -hmm. of two young daughters, and that is paramount in my life mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. And so being able to be more present for my children, mm -hmm. I think is a big one for me. I, I sometimes get asked, what do you think of work-life balance? <laughs> yeah. And I have to tell you, and I'm sure many of your, I think many of your audience <laughs> members and, and, and watchers will relate, there is no such thing as work-life balance. That is a myth. I think it actually does a disservice mm -hmm. when we talk about a work-life balance because to be a, a working woman, whatever that work looks like, whether it's inside the home or outside the home, that is work. Let's make sure we acknowledge oh, yeah. that. Yeah. Um, you know, and you have a job or you have children or you were taking care of uh, parents, mm -hmm. whatever it may be, um, it really comes down to what are your priorities, right? What are the boundaries that you're willing to set and how much are you willing to stick to those boundaries? Mm. And then having those days where you recognize you know what? You can't do it all at the same time. Right. And that's okay. Right. Um, those are the things that I constantly remind myself. So again, when, when you ask me, where do I want to be in five years? I want to be still leading a thriving, growing business, but I also want to be able to have those moments with my family that mm -hmm. truly make a difference. And some mm -hmm. days I'll be more of a career woman and some days I'll be more of a wife and mother. Um, mm -hmm. And that's okay. And I have to remind myself of that. And that's also a message that I want your viewers to take with them as well. I love that. I think that's a, a really important aspect of leadership, mm -hmm. Vanessa. And, you know, Wendy and I talk about this a lot off camera, on camera. We bleed off so much talent because we burn them out. I mean, this burn, nonprofit yeah. sector is hard. It's hard work. It's tough topics. Um, it's not all just, you know, the beautiful part of, of society. It can be really gritty. And so it takes its toll. And if we don't start to understand mm -hmm. that and navigate towards that, we're going to just lose more and more talent. And so yeah. mm -hmm. I, I appreciate you, you know, uh, illuminating that and really putting it into your own uh, personal context. Um, it, this has really been a lot of fun. Vanessa Ruiz, president of Bear Fruit. Check out bearfruit.co and you can learn more about Vanessa and her team and the things that they do. Um, I always like to remind folks, you brought up Vanessa uh, grant writing. The illustrious mm -hmm. governor of our state 
uh, started out as a grant writer for an organization I served on on the board of. Um, she was an, an amazing grant writer, a person of great detail, and she really allowed us to project up so that we could become the largest domestic violence shelter in America. And now she's governor of the state. So, <laughs> I mean, these things <laughs> have a trajectory. And uh, I loved how you were able, Vanessa, to help us along that journey. It was really, really fun. Thank you for being with us on the nonprofit show. Thank you so much, Julie. It's been a true pleasure. And Wendy, again, thanks to you as well. I appreciate it. My cup is filled. Yeah, it's it's really been nice. You know, yeah. uh, we need to have more and more people that speak up and talk about their, yes. their journeys um, and to encourage us because it's not always easy as we were talking mm -hmm. about. You know, we have amazing partners that also are on this journey with us, and they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Fundraiser Friday, and your part-time controller. Ladies, this has been magical. You've given me a lot to think about. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. It's been a pleasure. Likewise. You know, we end every episode of the nonprofit show with this simple message, but it's pretty complicated if you think about it. Mm -hmm. And it goes like this to stay well so you can do well. Thank you, ladies.